الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين وأصحابه الطاهرين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا مولانا محمد وبارك وسلم صلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا حبيب الله الحمد لله تعالى إن شاء الله today we will be looking at chapter 40 of 56. So Alhamdulillah, uh, in terms of chapters, we well into the text. We'll be looking at chapter 40 of Shamayl al tirmizi And this chapter is entitled That Which Was Narrated Regarding the Worship of the Messenger of Allah mm-hmm. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In essence, everything that the Prophet does, every movement, every word, everything that the Prophet does is an act of worship. However, this has been mentioned as a specific and dedicated chapter by Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah ta'ala. And in it, he's mentioned certain specific examples of specific worships of the Prophet And this may be to highlight the status of the Prophet and to actually show us that despite being infallible and not ever sinning, the Prophet ﷺ still worshipped far greater than you may actually imagine. Sometimes the purpose being for the forgiveness of his ummah, his followers, and sometimes the response when questioned was to show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon him. The Prophet sallallahu status is such that is unmatched by any wali, any friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even by any prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is by no means to say that the status of the other prophets was not absolutely immense and huge but in comparison the Prophet وسلم, is the best creation, the supreme creation and the highest ranked out of all of the creation including all the prophets and messengers of Allah and yet still we will see inshallah how excessively the Prophet وسلم, used to worship and there's no doubt that everything that the Prophet ﷺ did was an example and is an example for us to follow. We need to then consider that the Prophet ﷺ, in spite of being infallible, in spite of being Prophet and Messenger of Allah, not just a Prophet and Messenger of Allah, but the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this was his worship. Where do we fare in our you know, in the amount of worship that we do? And realistically speaking, this is something that all of us should assess on a daily basis. And many of the Sufiya uh, have said this, they've said, hold yourself accountable before one day you will be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do you, you know, your own accountability. And that is, you know, at the end of the day, we should and I, you know, I urge you, I encourage you to adopt this practice is that 
you consider how much of that day, how much of the previous 24 hours you have spent in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hopefully this will help you to actually realize uh, your goals and targets in terms of worshipping and sort of presenting yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact of the matter is that worship of any kind, one other factor that you need to remember is that worship of any kind is rewarded according to the intention. All actions are judged or rewarded according to intentions. The, the more sincere your action is, your intention is, the, the greater the reward. And yet the Prophet you know, who can be more sincere than the Prophet And then ourselves, look at us. You know, the worship that we do, how sincere are we in that worship? Do we even approach the first level of ihsan, of sincerity, which is to worship with this in your heart and in your mind with this certainty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us, do we actually worship in that manner? And never mind the, the greater state, state, uh, the stage of ihsan, which is that you worship as if you're watching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that people, <coughs> it's narrated by Imam Abu Dawood, that you know, people pray and they are rewarded, they are given one-tenth of the reward of that action. And some will pray and they are given uh, one-ninth and then one-eighth and a quarter and up to a half of that reward that they could potentially achieve simply because of um, their intentions being not as sincere as they could be. But on the other hand, you know, this is talking about faraiz. We're talking, if you look first of all at compulsory acts and that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated us to do, the five, on a daily basis, you have your five daily prayers. If there's any lacking in any of those prayers, on the Day of Judgment, the very first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question about is prayers. And so if there's any missing, if there's anything, any lacking in those prayers, again, another narration of Abu Dawood, um, which states that on the Day of Judgment, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold people to account for is their prayers. And if there's any lacking in that, then whatever nafal they have offered, whatever optional prayers they have offered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use them to complete their uh, record of obligatory prayers. Now if there's somebody who, you know, whose faraiz are, are lacking in some way, and then he never offers optional or voluntary prayers, then there's going to be nothing to actually make up for. So this is something that you should be looking at also when praying in the is that uh, often a lot of people will leave out their optional prayers and wafil and even sometimes the, the sunnahs because they're not mandatory. Well, what happens if you fall short on your mandatory uh, worship? And so this is something that you may rely on um, should there be a shortfall in your mandatory worship, in your uh, obligatory worship. So in this chapter, Imam Tirmidhi Rahmanullah Ta'ala, he's narrated 24 narrations, 24 ahadith. And the first narration, the first three narrations are actually more or less identical, but narrated through different chains. Um, just to strengthen this idea 
that the Prophet ﷺ, in spite of being infallible, worshipped a very excessive amount. And so this is established very thoroughly by Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah ta'ala by uh, virtually repeating the same narration three times from different narrators. The first narration is narrated by Sayyidina Mughira bin Shoba radiallahu ta'ala who says that the Messenger of Allah would pray to the extent that his feet would become swollen. It was asked of him, do you perform a task of such great effort? Ya Rasulullah, you exert yourself in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet Allah has forgiven. Now, the, the words that are used in the hadith, the literal translation, وَقَدْ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you exert yourself to this extent, yet Allah has forgiven. Now remember, this is the very literal interpretation. That Allah has forgiven your previous and your forthcoming sins. This in itself is an expression of the infallibility of the Prophet sallallahu the isma of the Prophet sallallahu For those who, whose thinking is not completely sort of natural and sort of uh, they think you know have some breadth to their thinking and their ideologies it is very very easy to understand how this in itself is an expression of the isma and the infallibility of the prophet however going off the literal very literal sense uh, this can be and has been misconstrued by people to assume that because these are the, these very similar words to this are used in the Quran as well where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the infallibility of the Prophet sallallahu it's done in the same manner and the Sahaba are taking those words from the Quran this is why you, this, uh, this is an answer to another question which is why would the Sahaba put it in that, in that manner why wouldn't they just say you know that you are masum, you are infallible the reason is because they are imitating the words of the Quran which describe the infallibility of the Prophet And so they are only imitating what the Quran says and then it is for us to actually find the true, true interpretation of what the Quran says. And this is exactly the same terminology that is used. Literally translated would mean or one literal translation could be that your previous and your forthcoming sense. Um, however, this is not the Aqidah of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah hold firmly to the Aqidah that all Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa are infallible and they do not sin. There's different ways that this has been explained, you know, why this particular wording has been used. In my mind, this in itself is an expression of infallibility. That there are, there is nothing to forgive before or after. You know, that your previous and your after sins have, there's nothing to forgive. There is no sins. It's an expression of infallibility in itself when you understand it in that manner. However, um, people like uh, Imam Ahmad Raza, rahimahullah ta'ala, his interpretation of this verse is that for your sake, Allah has forgiven those before you your ancestors, talking once again about the uh, ancestry of the Prophet and those to come after you, your Ummah, your nation, the sinful amongst your nation. So this is how it's interpreted. Um, and also we have this concept that um, the good deeds sometimes, good deeds when associated with a person of a lower rank is in its own right, a virtue and a good deed. But for a person of a superior rank, it is considered to be something, an action that he should not be doing. He should be doing something more uh, excessive. Um, for example, you know, there's a few examples that we can, we can look at. And that is that every person's, uh, what may be referred to as sins, um, or short 
shortcomings for every person it's depending on their individual rank and so with the Prophet ﷺ having the greatest rank in all of creation therefore something that may actually we might consider, consider very virtuous for ourselves would not be something worthy of the station of the Prophet ﷺ there'd be a far greater expectation there and so for example the incident regarding Sayyidina uh, Ibn Umm Maktoum, who was a blind companion, he came to the Prophet ﷺ, and at that time the Prophet ﷺ was busy uh, sort of introducing Islam to some of the senior sort of uh, leaders of the Arabs, the Quraysh, and therefore. Uh, did not prefer to be disturbed whilst again at the same time the Prophet Sallallahu what was he doing? He was doing his duty and service to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala of propagating the deen but yet this is something that uh, although being virtuous in its own right may have been something where the Prophet Sallallahu uh, should have paid attention to uh, the companion um, we have no right to actually assume that this is something that the Prophet ﷺ, um, you know, may, uh, should have or should not have done. It's just an example of how something which is um, at face value is actually serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There may be a second interpretation for that. Similarly, um, after the Battle of Badr, out of his immense compassion and rahmah and mercy, the Prophet ﷺ opted to follow the view of, uh, or to take on board the view of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq ta'ala, which was to take, uh, which was to, to either take money or to, for if any of the prisoners that were captured, if they were uh, to educate ten people, they would be set free. And yet, this was not something that, uh, you know, Sayyidina Umar ta'ala, he had views contrary to this, and later we see that for the future Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defined a different protocol. Now again, this was not a sin. So we see that, you know, so it, depending on the state, somebody's status, sometimes doing doing what we refer to as maybe as khilaf e awla, you know, something which is, uh, uh, it, there's two virtuous deeds, both of them virtuous, but choosing the lesser option may actually be considered as something um, in that category for depending on the rank of that person. That's one sort of way of explaining. But the basic concept for me is what I said before, is that you know if we take on board the interpretation given to us by Imam Ahmad Raza ta'ala, it is that those before and those after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, are forgiven for his sake. There's no, con there's no concept of forgiveness for the Prophet ﷺ because he's infallible, he's masoom. There's no sins to be forgiven. And again, also the fact that this in itself, this terminology could be uh, you know, representative of the Prophet ﷺ's and his infallibility. I don't want to go into a lot more detail because this is quite a, a lengthy discussion. It will turn out to be quite a lengthy discussion. And this is actually an issue of uh, aqidah and so on. And alhamdulillah, you know, our aqidah is defined. That all prophets and messengers of Allah, uh, including the Prophet wasallam, are infallible. They do not sin. And so, um, I'm going to leave it at that. And then inshallah, at some point, if we're ever discussing uh, this topic in a, in a discussion of aqidah, I will shed further light on this particular topic. So just basically to note for us is that we the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, our belief and our aqidah is that all prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are ma'asum, they are free of sin, they are infallible. <coughs> the next hadith is narrated by Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala. He says the messenger of Allah would pray until his feet would become swollen. It was asked of him, do you do this? Yet, it has come to you. Now again referring to the Qur'an, this is why I was telling you that there's no question of why the Sahaba put it in this way, because this was the wording of the Qur'an. They were simply repeating what was, you know, they 
in my mind, you know, they 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 would not wish to bring something or say something in their own words when the Quran has described it, when Allah has described it in the Quran for them. And so that's what they're doing. This is why in this narration of Sayyidina Abu Huraira, the wording is that do you do this? Yet it has come to you that Allah has forgiven all of your uh, ancestors' sins and all those that are to come, or that is to come. And that's the interpretation of, uh, that we, we uh, use from Imam Ahmad Raza, Rahmanullah Ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ on this occasion he replied that should I not be a grateful slave? If this is the fact, if Allah has protected me, you know, and if I am infallible and Allah has given me this status uh, amongst the creation, being the supreme creation, should I not thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this? So we see here uh, this concept being established that the worship of the Prophet ﷺ was not for the purpose of seeking and worship is not always for the purpose of seeking forgiveness rather sometimes wo uh, worship is simply out of gratitude and you know to bring this to uh, this is something that Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha she also narrates a very similar wording from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as well and this is a very beautiful narration it's narrated by uh, Sayyida Ata uh, he says that he once asked Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, he said, tell me what in your opinion was the most amazing thing about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So he asked her, what, is, what do you think, what in your opinion was the most amazing thing about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And look at this answer. She initially, she said, was there anything about the Prophet ﷺ that wasn't amazing? And she started crying, she broke down in tears, she was reminded of the Prophet ﷺ. And she said, you know, was there anything at all about the Prophet ﷺ that wasn't amazing? But then she said, well, if I, if I was to choose one particular thing, then she said that one night um, the Prophet ﷺ came home to sleep and just after a short while after, of, of, of laying on his bed, after a short while, he said to me, uh, he said, uh, let, me, let me go or let me be for I want, for I want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so she says that the Prophet sallallahu stood up and he started worshipping and he started crying so much that the Prophet sallallahu tears fell onto his blessed chest. And he continuously, uh, he was continuously crying through his worshipping. He, this is how he did his qiyam, that he went into ruku, and he was still crying, and he went into sajda, and he was still crying, and he completed his namaz, and right the way through, he was crying all the way through. And, you know, this is something that we can sense is for the sake of the ummah, you know, for his his, uh, his followers, his devotees. This is why uh, Imam Ahmad Raza, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions this very beautifully in one of his, uh, his couplets in a praise in a nath which he mentions about shafa, about intercession. And he says, um, the beginning of that nath is very beautiful in itself. He says, Kya hi zawq afza shafa'at hai tumhari wa hawa. In Urdu and Punjabi, this term wawa is used to express uh, amazement at something. And he says, Ya Sulaha, how amazing is your intercession? Kya hi zauq afza shafaat hai, tumhari wawa. Qarz leti hai guna, parhez gari wawa. He says that on the Day of Judgment, we will find virtuous people begging and seeking. Uh, sins from other people in order to partake and benefit from the shafa'a, the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he goes on to describe this, what Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she says there. He says, and because she says, he, he cried continuously throughout his worship and he worshipped until Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu ta'ala gave the azan for Fajr. All night long, 
امام احمد رضا ہی سے سیم تھنگ ہی سے اشک شب بھر انتظار افم امت میں باہر he says that all night long tears fall from your eyes in anticipation of the forgiveness of your ummah ashq means tears ashq shab bhar all night long intezar e afwe ummat mein badi intezar waiting af is from the arabic word uh, forgiveness afwe ummat mein badi that all night long tears fall from your eyes in anticipation of the forgiveness of your ummah me fida chand aur yu akhtar shumari wa he says how amazing the, the, the moon and it spends the night counting the stars you know imagine for, for us those who are looking at the night sky what is most prominent and most evident the full moon or stars in the background and he says describing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the moon he says the moon spending his night awake counting the stars being a metaphor for staying awake seeking and waiting in anticipation of the forgiveness of his ummah of his people ashq shab bhar iltizar e उम्मत में बहे अश्क शब्बर family speaks punjabi i picked that up just as i grew older from the family and having been taught urdu as the first language that i spoke and english at school i was they i now speak fluently three languages straight away um and then obviously i learned arabic and persian through my studies um and i didn't want my children to actually lose out on that so message for anybody if you do speak or do open job if you're able to make sure you pass this on to your children that they you know it's always um, 
beneficial to, to know uh, more than one language. Um, but anyway, that's what Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she tells us about um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the same question. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that why wouldn't I do that? No, why wouldn't I spend the whole night? Uh, shouldn't I wish to be a grateful servant of Allah? <laughs> and why wouldn't I? When the Prophet ﷺ said that today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to me uh, the verses of Surah Al Imran, Inna fi Khalqis Samawat, and uh, the, the last verse of Surah Al Imran, the last ruku of Surah Al Imran that was revealed on that night. It's also narrated by Sayyidina Abu Huraira, the third narration is that the Prophet ﷺ would pray until his feet would become swollen. It was asked of him, do you do this? Yet it has come to you that Allah has forgiven all your, uh, all the sins of your ancestors and those to come. He replied, should I not be a grateful slave? So we see those three narrations as I mentioned in the start. Those first three narrations are more or less identical. And the purpose is to establish this fact that the Prophet Wasallam's worship was for the purpose of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also from other narrations we see for the sake of his ummah and not because the Prophet Wasallam re required to worship excessively for the forgiveness of his sins. What sins? He was infallible. And so that's quite well established by uh, Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah ta'ala. Now, there's one thing that um, is, there's a question that needs answering here, which is that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited from worshipping excessively. And for those of you who've, uh, who've studied Riyadh al-Salihin, um, either here or elsewhere, or with me, or with, you know, with someone else, or your own study, you will know that there's a chapter in Riyadh al-Salihin which Imam Nawabi has entitled Moderation in Worship, Moderation in Obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, was, uh, this is well discussed in that chapter, um, the fact that you know, immediately the question comes to mind, should someone be moderate in their worship or their obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What, what, is, what is moderation in something good? No, uh, surely you should do as much as possible and not be, uh, not do uh, worship in, in moderation. And yet, for the Ummah, this is the instruction. Why? Because there's many different reasons. One of them, the Prophet ﷺ explains himself and he says that you will carry on worshipping until there will come a point when you become tired. Or when, you, when your heart is no longer actually in it. Tired in both senses, physically and also sort of psychologically, emotionally, your heart and your emotions are not there anymore. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to reward you and He never tires. So you can never worship so much that you will achieve the maximum reward that you're going to achieve. Basically that's the message that Allah will tire from rewarding you. Therefore, don't worship excessively on one occasion to the extent that you then become tired and it stops you from worshipping in the future. Don't like don't spend one whole night sort of from you know all night long until daybreak worshipping um, and then you know for the next year you're on a break. That's that's what it means. Do a little, do what you can, and do it regularly. The Prophet said the best actions are those that are done <coughs> done regularly. So even if it's just for example, if it's tilawat of the Quran. If you do one ruku every night or every morning and you do it every single day of your life, it's better and that would be better for you than actually reading the whole Quran in one night maybe and then never reading it again for the rest of the year uh, and just doing it once a year. So re repeated actions, regular actions are actually better than sort of one-off in that sense. But the fact is 
you have to look at all the reasons behind that prohibition. Behind the Prophet actually saying, don't worship in that manner. Why? You know, uh, the main reason being that you, you will become tired. Your heart will not be in it. It may limit your worshipping in the future. Any of those reasons, do they apply to the Prophet No. And first of all, secondly, how can someone tire when he's experiencing those blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we cannot even imagine that the Prophet experienced during his worship? Now, how could this was direct communication between Allah and his servant? We can't even imagine the kind of uh, barakat, the kind of blessings that the Prophet was receiving whilst he was in worship. Why would anyone ever tire of those blessings and you know and in that sense? So there's no reason uh, the Prophet there was no concept of the Prophet not you know doing too much and then not doing uh, anything else, or there was no concept of the Prophet you know, tiring uh, emotionally from that because of those blessings and barakat. And the Prophet himself he said um, that the coolness of my eyes, the contentment of my heart, in other words, is in salah. Ju'ilat qurratu aini fi salah. And this, this, this was the Prophet ﷺ. When he felt, you know, we feel tired and we feel when we've exerted ourselves, we might get this feeling of, um, you know, laziness and neglecting the prayer, looking at the physical uh, aspects of it and, you know, what it involves. And yet the Prophet ﷺ, it's narrated by the Prophet uh, around and about the Prophet ﷺ that whenever he felt tired, whenever he felt uh, sort of uh, upset for any reason, tired or upset or in any sort of distress, the Prophet ﷺ would go into prayer. This would be his his sort of uh, remedy for that. And so, uh, there's no possibility of that. Thirdly, <coughs> the Prophet the, the third reason that don't, you know, everyone has a right over you. This is another hadith uh, as well, uh, also mentioned in uh, Riyadh al-Saliheen, uh, that the Prophet instructed his Sahaba to fulfill all their rights. And some of them who were worshipping all night and fasting all day, the instruction that the Prophet gave to them was, no, your body has a right over you, your family has a right over you, those around you, they all have rights over you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rights over you. Fulfill all your rights. Don't sort of neglect others' rights simply to do excessive worship. That is part of when done with the right intention, fulfilling others' rights is also an act of worship, it's an act of virtue. This was the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ to his companions. Again, can it be imagined or perceived of the Prophet ﷺ that he would worship so much that he would not be able to fulfill his other rights and duties? No. So none of the reasons of for the prohibitions actually apply to the Prophet ﷺ. And therefore, there's no question about why the Prophet ﷺ, uh, instructed and advised his ummah to uh, do their worship in portions that are manageable, but manageable for them. That's the main thing. Yes, the instruction was do it in, in portions that are manageable, but manageable for them. And the Prophet Wasallam's worship was manageable for him. It's a very interesting, very beautiful point there. Well, there came a point when the Prophet Wasallam worshipped so much, his feet swollen, standing all night long, and feet begin to bleed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the Quran Ya Ayyuhal Muzzammin and look at how he addresses the Prophet mm. and they, again this is something that often those who don't have the relevant knowledge may criticize and say why does it only why does the Quran only mention the Prophet name uh, a few times and Allah mentions other prophets and other uh, sort of saying Musa al Islam, Isa al Islam again and again. And the fact of the matter is, the Prophet, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the Holy Prophet throughout the Quran. But the fact is, those you love, you do not address them 
with their name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to address the Prophet sallallahu uh, through his attributes and the position that he's in at that particular time. Which means, and Ya Ayyuh al muzammil means the one who's, uh, or one who's covered and enshrouded in, in, in the mantle, in the shawl. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Prophet sallallahu in that manner. Qumil layla illa qalila. Allah, look at this, the rest of the world you know, could you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much? Could anyone worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that Allah Himself says, Don't worship me so much? Mm-hmm. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to the Prophet in the Quran, He says, Don't stand all night in worship. You know, even, you know the, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is such a beautiful expression. That the Prophet worshipped so much that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then instructs the Prophet to not worship so much. But anyhow, um, you know, we digress from the actual, well, not so much a digression, but we, uh, we, we should move on. Um, these things will consume the whole session. So the, the, that that is to address that issue that uh, you know there's no reason why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam should worship in that uh, you know should, that rule should apply to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. There's something interesting narrated by Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu taala as well, and he says that sometimes worship is done. People worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of want and out of desire to enter Jannah and he says this is the worship of a merchant and this is the worship of a merchant he's trading with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worship for Jannah so that's how Sayyidina Ali and he describes that one. and he says sometimes worship is done out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of fear of being thrown into the hellfire fear of being disobedient to Allah he says this is the worship of a slave that a slave does what he's instructed to do out of fear of being punished by his master and then Sayyidina Ali he says sometimes worship is done simply for gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no other reason no greed or desire for Jannah no fear of Jahannam of the hellfire Simply to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, this is the worship of true men, of free men. And um, it's a beautiful expression in, in that manner. This is what we need to try to get to this point where we are worshipping to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than you know, to uh, fulfill our obligations or to trade for Jannah or to stay out of the house Um The next hadith in this chapter is narrated by Sayyidina Aswad bin Yazid. He says, I asked Sayyidina Aisha regarding the night prayer of the Messenger of Allah. She said he would sleep for the first portion of the night and then stand for prayer. And when it was just before daybreak, he would pray the Witr prayer. Then he would come to his bed and if he wished, he would approach his wife and when he would hear the call to prayer he would immediately get up and if if need be he would do ghusl and if not he would perform the ablution and leave for prayer so she basically described the routine of the prophet وسلم, of the night in that hadith <coughs> There's actually, you know, um, this routine is something which the medics and well, uh, usually when I'm talking about uh, sort of medics, I'm talking about traditional uh, medics and not sort of modern, uh, modern science and doctors and so on. This is something that the uh, the uh, medics, traditional medics, they say that this is the best routine uh, for the night. Um, however, we do know that you know, um, the, 
the relationship of the husband and, and wife is such that there's no stipulation um, as to when this relationship may and may not be consummated. However, there are some, the Sufiya, they have mentioned many things regarding some of the, the different times. For example, you know, if, there's, if it's a time that will cause delay or it's actually uh, the very time for a prayer, um, any children that may be conceived in that time, they said, it is a serious danger of those children being uh, disobedient to parents and sort of you know, the parents not benefiting from those children. The next of these is narrated by Sayyidina Qureb radiallahu ta'ala. He says that Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas once informed him that he slept at the house of Maimuna, his auntie, his khala. So we see this is the reason why Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas uh, uh, Abbas radiallahu ta'ala, you know, this is one of the reasons that he was able to stay over was that this was uh, he was, as well as being the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> he was the nephew of Sayyidah Maimuna, uh, whose house the Prophet Sallallahu was staying in that night. He says, I rested upon the width of the cushion and the Messenger of Allah rested upon its length. The Messenger of Allah slept until half of the night had passed or just before or after half of the night had passed. The Messenger of Allah then awoke wiped the effects of sleep from his blessed face and recited the last ten verses of Surah al Imran. So the Prophet woke up, wiped his face and read and recited the last ten verses of Surah al Imran. He then stood and performed the ablution in its totality from a water skin that was suspended and began to pray. I stood to his side and the Messenger of Allah placed his right hand upon my head took hold of my ear and twisted it. Then he prayed two cycles, then two or two units, then another two units, then two units, then two units, then two and then two units. He uh, mentioned this six times, so in total twelve units. He then performed the witr prayer and sat until Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu ta'ala gave the call to prayer and he stood and prayed two light, in other words, short units and left to pray the morning prayer, the Fajr prayer. So these two last ones, they were the two sunnahs of Fajr prayer. And the rest, they were the Hajjad. And so, in the Arabic, this is referred to as Salatul Layl, the prayer of the night. And in terms of, in the terminology of Hadith, this Salatul Layl, this is actually referred to um, this refers to the Hajjad prayer, uh, not Tarawi, which will come, become relevant in a moment uh, in another narration as it's mentioned there. Where does the term the Hajjad come from? Is that an Arabic term? Or it? Yeah, it, it is. It's a, um, but, um, something I don't have committed to memory at present. Inshallah, I'll come back to that. I remember, I remember coming across Salat al labels and it confused me. Well, that, it's one of the same, but inshallah I will, I will come back to you. Um, you know how we have um, different times, times in the winter and summer? Mm. How do we find that balance between the night? We're in a slightly difficult um, sort of climate, so yes, I understand why you're saying in the summer. And especially uh, during Ramadan in the summer. Um, the, the advice I can give there is that the Prophet said, is anyone who, who habitually prays during the night, so in other words, has a habit of praying the Hajjid, or has a habit of doing any other act of worship during the night, if for some reason he misses that habit, he should do it before Zenith, before Zawal time in the day. So if there's any some any reason that obstructs That's you know for that reason, well, I mean again, if if the time is so short that there that there isn't any possibility, then to keep up the habit, mm -hmm. you know, that would be my advice to keep up the habit that can be done, and surely Allah rewards our intentions, yeah. and you know you can expect to be rewarded for that. Like, it's a valid obstruction. 
like a week, like for example, the next day, where the day ends at five o'clock, the night begins at five ten. So mm -hmm. when would it be recommended to sleep and then wake up? The recommendation from the Sunnah actually is to pray Isha and then to go to sleep quite early after praying Isha. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, and, and the, the, the actual prohibition, or rather I should say, the actual advice from the Prophet <coughs> which, uh, in which the Prophet advises not to talk excessively after Isha prayer. That's the reason for that. So you sleep. The prophetic routine was sleep early, wake up early. And part of that was to actually wake up during the night to worship. So that, that's, that's the best routine. Living in extreme climates, that can become difficult sometimes in that when the night, the nightfall begins as early as, you know, when you have Maghrib beginning at four o'clock, it'd be difficult for a lot of people to actually, you know, if they're reading Isha at six o'clock to go to sleep at, uh, immediately after Isha. So we just have you just have to strike a balance and then with the correct intention when you do things hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you according to your intention. Um, because you can't change the cycle of the sun. Um, there's only two options. You either move to a, a more moderate climate or you try to work around the climate that you're you're, you're living in. So you know Again, if it's a longer night, if it also thing to consider, if it's a longer night, the portions, you know, for example, delaying Isha to a third of the night, that one third will be longer than, uh, you know, there'll be more hours than in the summer. So, you know, the, you've got to take that into consideration as well. Alright, so. The, that particular hadith, as I mentioned, it talks about um, Salatul Layl. The, the next hadith is narrated by Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala. Sorry, yeah, we've... Uh, there's a couple of things to mention from that. First of all, the Prophet sallallahu recitation of those last ten verses of uh, <clears throat> Surah Ali Ibn. This tells us that you should recite some portion of the Quran um, if you are in a position to do so when you wake up. The Sunnah of the Prophet to recite some portion of the Quran if you are in um, the position to do so when you wake up. Another thing, you know, this talking about sort of holding the ear or twisting the ear. Um, this was obviously uh, not an act of aggression, rather it's an act of compassion um, on <coughs> you know, uh, the part of the Prophet ﷺ. In some narrations it mentions that he was stood on the wrong side. The Prophet sort of grabbed him by the ear and moved him round to the other side to indicate that he should be stood on the right of the Imam. As, as to the uh, Raka'at of the Hajjad of Salatul Layl, um, there's different narrations that have been narrated um, regarding, you know, and you'll see them coming up as well, where different quantities have been narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sometimes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the best uh, sort of correlation between those is that it depends on different times. You know, depending on what time the Prophet ﷺ woke up, how much time he had, you know, what, uh, and depending on other factors, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ may have prayed more units, and sometimes maybe less. And this will be uh, mentioned shortly. Um, in the in the next hadith, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas and he says that the Prophet ﷺ would pray 13 units in the night. And so if you count three units of uh, witr, because that was the method of the prayer, was that to pray Shahmaz, leave the witr, then read the hajjah and finish off with the witr. So if you include three units of witr, that becomes then 10 units of the hajjah. 
and three units of Buddha, as described <coughs> by Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas. If, however, <coughs> you include two units of Fajr Salah, so he only mentions that, he doesn't specify in what order. He simply says 13 units in total. He doesn't tell us what order. So if you include the two sunnahs of Fajr as well, then that would mean eight units of the Hajjat, three units of Witr, and two units of the sunnahs of the Fajr. Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that when the Prophet sallallahu would not pray in the night as his sleep, because of sleep or maybe uh, fatigue preventing him from doing so, he would pray 12 units during the day. So before the wild time. This is that same thing, that same instruction that I was telling you before, was that, um, you know, there is this notion that the Hajjud was an extra prayer, which was farz, which was compulsory for the Prophet ﷺ, but not for the Ummah. If this was the reason, then that prayer during the day would become qaza of the Hajjud. And if it wasn't, then we still had that instruction from the Prophet ﷺ that if anybody misses their habitual worship during the night and isn't able to get up to do it, they should keep up that habit and they should do it before the wild time on the following day. So then we have that, um, we have that instruction. The next hadith is narrated by Sayyidina Abu Huraira who says that the Prophet said, when any of you awakes in the night, he should open his prayer with two light units, in other words, short units. Um, the, the possible hikmah and wisdom behind that could be is that if you begin with two very long units, it may cause you to become tired and you know limit the amount of worship that you do, maybe additional units that you pray. And so begin with two light units. Um, this possibly could also refer to two units of Tahiyatul <coughs> Wudu, the two units that you're supposed to pray, or uh, it is preferable to pray, should I say, um, after having done Wudu. And these two units, it's actually that, that are prescribed, are two short units. They're not two uh, long or excessively long units. So maybe this could possibly be referring to those two units. And one thing that does need to be pointed out, the Prophet also indicated, and he, he sort of he, he uh, clarified on occasions that excessive number of siddhas is not as desirable as a longer length of sajda. Right? So for example, reading 100 units in a night may not be as rewarding as reading 4 or 6 or 8 units with longer qirat, longer ruku and longer sajda. It's actually better to take your time and read longer units than more number of units. But in this particular hadith, the Prophet says, when you begin, begin with a short unit so that you do complete it and then you are able to uh, sort of include more units into that. There's also mention of which some, uh, uh, Imam Hafiz Ibn Hajar Asqalani, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions in his commentary of Sahih Bukhari something very interesting. He says that it's mentioned in a narration that when a person sleeps, shaitan, he ties three knots in his head. And when he wakes up and the person recites some Quran, as mentioned in the previous um, in the previous narration about the Prophet ﷺ waking up and reciting the, the Qur'an. He, when he wakes up and he takes the name of Allah, this could be in the form of recitation of the Qur'an or the dua that the Prophet ﷺ, we've, we've gone through that chapter about the Prophet ﷺ sleep and the duas, you know, Allahumma uh, bismika amutu wa ahya, 
Oh, Alhamdulillah, that's before sleeping and when waking up, Alhamdulillah, illazi ahyana ba'da ma'amatana wa ilayhi nushur. The dua for waking, when waking up, if someone recites that and he takes the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he wakes up, the first of those knots is untied. And then when he does wudu, the second knot is untied. And then when he reads, some, when he uh, performs some prayer, that third knot is untied. And then he's completely free of any effects of the shaitan that were on him. And so uh, Hafiz ibn Hajar, he actually says that maybe the reason for this was that he wakes up, he takes the name of Allah, he's done wudu, he still has some effects of the shaitan on him. And that effect will be removed by praying. So therefore read two short units to remove all the effects of the shaitan and then you are solely focused and free of any effects of the shaitan for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's something interesting that Hafiz ibn Hajar, uh, he mentions uh, in his commentary of the time. Obviously, um, one point, I don't think it should need clarifying, but I will do, um, as you know, this is something that is recorded and maybe uh, watched by others as well. This does not apply to the Prophet ﷺ. The shaitan has no way of influencing the Prophet ﷺ. <coughs> Sayyidina Zaid bin Khalid Juhani radiallahu ta'ala, he says that I decided one day that I would observe the prayer of the Messenger of Allah, so I lay down upon the threshold of either his home or his tent. Now, the commentator, uh, sorry, the narrator of this hadith, he doesn't know what he heard from the Sahabi, he's forgotten. And this is the degree of caution that the, uh, the aima of hadith they took, uh, the imam <coughs> of hadith took when narrating the hadith, that if they forgot even one word, they would point out. So he says, I don't remember whether he said tent or whether he said home. And he says, I, I, I lay down upon the threshold of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's home or tent. Thus the Messenger of Allah prayed two light, two short units, then he prayed two long units. And he said it, the way he says it is, he two long, long, long units, three times. He repeats that word three times. He tells us that they would have been very lengthy units, the way he's uh, repeated that three times, long, long, long units. <coughs> and then he prayed two cycles, um, other than the two before that, then another two, and then another two, and, and so on. And then he prayed with her prayer, and he then tells that there were 13 uh, units in total. You know, there are 13 units in total. So again, you know, that doesn't necessarily state that the, you know, the, the units of the Hajjah that were prayed were 10. Possibility is if you take three units, because remember, there are uh, Aimma who whose view is that Witr is one unit. So according to that, it would be 12 units of the Hajjah and one unit of Witr. But for me, the Ahnaf, our view is three Witr. So three Witr, that leaves uh, 10 units, but out of them it does mention that the first two were shorter, there's a possibility that those were Tahiyatul Wudu or whatever, and it's eight units, and or maybe part of them were um, the units of uh, Fajr Sunnah. There's also this, you know, the, uh, this thing about the, the threshold, whether it was the house or whether it was whether it was the house or the tent, some of the Aymah have actually specified that this was uh, during a journey. This was while the Prophet was traveling. <coughs> and it makes more sense, the reason being, that if the Prophet was resident in Medina Munawwara, he would spend the night at one of the homes of his wives. 
And therefore, it would be completely out of character to expect one of the Sahaba to be laying with his head on the threshold of the Prophet Sallallahu house. Which is why it makes more sense that this was during a journey when the Prophet Sallallahu on that journey perhaps was travelling without any of his wives, which, was, which, which did happen commonly. And he was then uh, sort of on the threshold of the tent of the Prophet Sallallahu where the Prophet Sallallahu was alone and he was observing the worship of the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> The next of these is narrated by Sayyidina Abu Salama bin Abdul Rahman. He says that Sayyidina, he asked Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, how was the prayer of the Messenger of Allah during Ramadan? She replied, the Messenger of Allah did not increase in Ramadan or in any month upon any more than 11 units. He would pray for Four units, do not ask about their beauty and their length. Then they would pray four units, do not ask about their beauty and their length. Then he would pray three units, and I asked, O Messenger of Allah, do you sleep before you perform the winter prayer? And he replied, O Aisha, indeed my eyes sleep, but my heart does not sleep. It remains connected with Allah subhanahu wa So there we see eight units uh, of Salatul Layl being mentioned, and in multiples of four. So four units, then four units, then three units, and specifying those three separately, um, it actually, you know, it helps our viewpoint, the Ahnaf, of that, that with there are three units connected with one Salat, one set of Salats. Also, um, one thing to mention there is that <coughs> It mentions that Abu Salama, he says that I asked Sayyidina Aisha, was the prayer of the Prophet <coughs> different during Ramadan? This in no way, shape or form is evidence for those people who believe that Taraweeh is eight units. It is absolute insanity for someone to conclude from here that Taraweeh is eight units. Very, very clear. Why? Sayyidina Aisha, what does she actually say? The Messenger of Allah did not increase in Ramadan or in any month upon <coughs> any more than eight units. That either means that this is not talking about Tarawi, this is talking about Salatul Layl, it's talking about Tahajjud, but the, throughout the year of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in any month. Or it means that the Prophet ﷺ prayed eight units of Taravi all year long, every month. Do you see how it's not possible to draw that conclusion from here? Now is not the time to actually go into that debate, it's more a debate of fit. But their viewpoint of eight Taravis is absolutely baseless. Absolutely. Quite categorical. If, if anyone is attempting to use this hadith, there's absolutely you know, no way that this can refer to Taravi. Um, So this is the reason why I'm asking is because the Prophet ﷺ did used to sort of increase the frequency of his worship, if you like, or the, uh, during Ramadan. And so this is why Sayyidina Abu Salama, he asked, you know, he has to find out what the routine of the Prophet ﷺ was during Ramadan. Did he pray more or, you know, what was the routine? And he was told by Sayyidina Aisha anha that the Prophet ﷺ, for his night worship, for the Hajjad prayer, he kept his routine the same throughout the year. We are now uh, sort of 
about 15 minutes over the time um, allocated for this session. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have covered about we've only covered about 10 of the 24 narrations in this chapter. So I'm going to stop there. And <clears throat> inshallah we will carry on, we will carry on and uh, take a further look at the worship of the Prophet in the next session. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa barik sallim salatu wa salam alayka ya Sayyidi ya Rasulullah wa ala alika wa sahabika ya Sayyidi ya Habibullah Allahumma rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sami al-alim wa tub alayna inna ka anta tawab al-rahim wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayr khalqihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi al-ma'in wa rahmatika ya Rasulullah